Um, yeah, so obviously with having that, it's good to always learn some, some things and, and everything else as well. And uh, I know sort of Katrina so as, as, as well. So yeah, yeah I thought it, uh, I just want to come along and, and sort of reconnect with uh, with the, with the with your business and uh, the uh, the county firm and that and yeah. Okay, so yeah. when did you did you meet Katrina through? Ah, oh, I didn't meet Katrina. Then? A few a few years ago now at a, at a at a um a business expo, and then um yeah we sort of just connected and yeah I sort of I caught up with her and had a coffee oh, a while ago now for a year ago or something like that and um. Yeah, got I got made redundant at the start of the year with all the old coronavirus thing and You did? Yeah, and just oh. sort of laid uh laid low for a little bit like I think a lot of people did. And um just kept working away in the background on the charity stuff and um and I've gone away for a long time and he sort of asked me to come along and and um yeah, yeah, join join the team which has been great and his way of adding values like you you guys, he puts on free workshops like a lunch learn and networking event. For the local businesses, and yeah, we've got one of those coming up on Friday the twenty fourth at um, the Lake House at Brightwater Tavern. So, is, is community? People. No, this is the business the sales squad. Oh, okay. yeah. So communities is um, yeah, we we'll just keep working away and doing sort of things and in the in the background. But we're um, we have the uh, we'll be launching officially, which means when we um, because we're sort of focused on youth, uh, getting in early with the, with those teenagers. With teenagers and the high school sort of kids yeah. to, um, I guess, try and um, teach them the stuff that they learn at school and you know, mm. self love, self care, resilience, um, you know, vulnerability, opening up, um, just yeah, all the like tools with exercise, mindfulness, mm. nutrition, wow. you know, finding what works for you, right? So needed. Yeah, thank you. But so we want to do these. Connect them with um, their passion. So if they're into surfing, we'll put them in Sunshine Coast Surf School. If they're into art or music, we're just got to find different organisations that we can support these kids in. So they a they have a something they're passionate about to look forward to. B they can start to build relationships because it's um, the data shows that teenage kids like through that sort of 15, 25, they're actually one of the loneliness lonely loneliest um, people in, in, the, in the country even though they're surrounded by the most amount of people. Mm. So if we can connect them with something they're passionate about, they can have a sense of belonging, build relationships, um, and, 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 and build those connections, then we can put them into programs, build them some, some skills up around themselves and, and um, you know, help them unlearn any stories that they've made up through their life experiences, which I'm guilty, you know, that, that we're all guilty of that. I'm not good enough, I'm not, enough, I'm not valuable, I'm not worthy, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, and then with the culminating in the rites of passage, we sort of you know, create as, as well, we've got an anthropologist that's consoling mm. to us. To, Do you talk about addiction? Uh, a bit, but we'll have people that are sort of specialists in, in mm. that as well, yeah, with alcohol and, and drugs. Okay. And, yeah. I've got three teenage boys and my brother and my husband are right into men's issues and yep. you know all of that sort of stuff. So um, mm. my brother runs Rock and Water down in New South Wales. Yeah, it's wow. about teaching men how to deal with things about violence yep. and yep. Um, also the pathways to manhood, which we don't do up here. But that initiation, particularly for boys, is really, really big. I mean, with the boys and girls, but we also want to run like whether it be one day or half day, however it looks, but workshops with like a mother and daughter or a mother and son or a father and daughter, father and son, or all families together because we don't want to give all these kids all this great information and tools to go out and, and you know, yeah. better themselves, but then they go home and their parents aren't in alignment. Yeah. Their parents aren't there willing to open up and have honest conversations around the dinner table with them because mm. mm. you've got to have that, that um, relationship first and foremost with the parents because you should, where, if something's wrong, you know, it's 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 okay. You should, you should. I want all kids to be able to just have that support from their parents, because you know, with kids they're so reactive, they don't really think. So they can make a, a, a decision based on they think, oh, I can't go to my parents about this. I've done something so terrible. I can't live with myself and mm. make that instant decision, because it's not just um, kids that have suffered unfortunately like trauma that's been a built up of over the years. But it's also some sometimes it's just that just done something silly yeah and, and you know in their eyes it's it's they the never, world. yeah 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 so 
Yeah. That'll be interesting. Oh, good. Great, Great to talks. connect with you both. See, I knew I was coming here for a good reason today. Yeah. <laughs> well, we might start because we're just recording yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, Hannah has already been in and hit the record button, so we may as well get going. Sure. Um, are there any other participants online? I can't see any so far. I think we're supposed to have a couple of other people here, but yeah, I disabled the waiting room. There's three who are potentially jumping in. Should you two go to the same wardrobe? I, know, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said that when she walked in. We obviously like, missed the memo like, today. We missed the memo. Oh, no, 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 You're pretty close. Much closer than that. There was a lovely long-legged young <laughs> girl and in walks a 50-year-old middle-aged woman dressed in the same. Oh, stop it. Like, of all days. <laughs> stop it. You look gorgeous, <laughs> you both do. <laughs> I like matching. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, it's yeah. very good. So it's all set up and sharing, they'll probably jump in a bit later. Okay, let's go back to that PowerPoint. Yeah, can I just have it on my screen? So I'm not looking at the screen. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you. It's going to be Thank strange you. talk trying to look at a camera and look at you two. So That's excuse okay. me if I'm twisting That's and turning. That's all right. Um, Thank you so much for coming. We've had a little bit of an introduction from your businesses, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, my name's Di, Di Brown. I am a Chartered Accountant and Business Advisor with SRJ Walker Wayland, um, based here on the Sunshine Coast. So I've got about 25 years experience in the SME market across a wide variety of industries. Um, I am a Chartered Accountant and I have done a lot of tax returns, financial statements, cash flows, all of those sort of things over the course of the last 25 years. But my passion is education. And it's educating business owners such as yourselves and those of you who are online about planning for your business success. So working with you to help you identify your business and lifestyle goals and putting in place strategies and detailed actions to achieve those goals. But more importantly, it's part of that process. It's educating business owners on the importance of financial literacy. Because as SME owners, we quite often start a business and try and figure out the numbers later. And with the current climate that we're facing, it's more important than ever to make sure that business owners have those financial literacy skills developed and the financial systems in place now so that they can access and understand financial information to make realistic, informed and timely decisions. So that's a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I work for SRJ Walker Wayland, Katrina's not here. Um, we are a firm of chartered accountants, auditors, business advisors. We've got about 50 odd staff spread across four offices. Uh, so we've got an office in Brisbane, Brendel, Caboolture, and here at the Sunshine Coast at Moffat Beach. We're in the spot. I love it. It's, it's so really cool. funky. Yeah, yeah. the comp shop downstairs, they yeah. have a great job. All furniture, yeah, really cool. everybody comes in and they're like, this is the problem. <laughs> I'm like, no, but they're really. That's good. That's good. So, yeah. So we like to think of ourselves as more than just accountants. So one of the things that we do differently is we look at a holistic business approach. So it's not just about your numbers. And a lot of chartered accountants will look at your financial statements and your tax returns. But that's backwards facing. That's all about what's happened in the past. And it doesn't allow you to make decisions on what you need to do going forward. So we like to work with the whole of the business and that means examining things like, you know, operational issues, financial issues, your systems and processes. Have you got your HR system set up right? Do you have the right staff with the right skill sets in the right roles? So we like to look at the whole of business to work with you to achieve your growth and profitability goals. So that's a little bit about us. We've already done the introduction today, so I can't um, actually hear anybody online, so we'll move on. So today, so we all know we've just been talking amongst ourselves, the last three or four months has been horrific. Um, there's no you know, sugar coating, what most businesses have gone through. Um, and we also know that, yes, there has been a lot of government support that have maybe got some businesses through the last three or four months that possibly wouldn't have made it. Mm -hmm but what happens in September? Mm -hmm. So we've been accessing our JobKeeper, we've been accessing our cash flow boost support. Um, some of you might've been accessing rent deferrals or lease deferrals. You might've been accessing, you know, the QRider loans or the federal government loan incentive scheme with six month mortgage deferrals. All of that is due to finish at the end of September, currently. 
all up for debate, yeah. but at the moment it is legislated to finish at the end of September. So what does that mean for us as business owners? And more importantly, what does it mean for our cash flow? So what we want to look at today is just to give you some background on how to understand some of the financial risks associated with failing to plan, monitor and review your budget. Um, Meryl, we were, it's Meryl. Yes. 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 we were having a little bit of a discussion before about it's amazing how many small business owners don't have a budget. And when I talk about a budget, there's three key elements of the budget. So that is your forecast profit and loss, your forecast balance sheet, and more importantly than ever, your cash flow. So today I'm going to give you some tips on how to actually prepare a cash flow. I've got a little template um, that you were all emailed this morning that hopefully you've got access to. In your packs here, um, those of you who are in the room, <laughs> we've got a copy of the PowerPoints, we've got a copy of a financial management work workbook, which you can take home. Um, there's some after workshop activities in there for you to work through, and also a copy of the cash flow template, but you've all got it in soft copy as well. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to actually prepare that. Then we'll talk about some cash flow management strategies and some different controls and things that you need to be looking at implementing um, to ensure that you're staying on top of cash flow and more importantly that you're identifying any potential cash flow pitfalls before they occur. And critically, what's going to happen in that quarter from October to December, which is, I think, going to be a rough time for a lot of people. We're also going to finish it up today with some financial management te techniques. So teaching you ways to utilise your financial records to actually access, um, you know, do a bit of variance analysis, get some financial key performance indicators out of there and start tracking your business performance on at least a fortnight, weekly, fortnightly or monthly basis, depending on the size of your business. Okay. So it's really important that as business owners, you know how to use your financial statements to calculate these five key things. So every business needs to know its break-even point. Every business unit needs to know its break-even point. You need to know what you can do to, in, what's the impact if you increase or decrease your turnover. Excuse me, my eyes are too. <laughs> you need to know how to calculate your gross profits and what does it mean when you've got fluctuations in that gross profit. You need to know how to calculate net profit and again, what you can do to impact that so it's going up. And more important than ever, you need to understand the importance of liquidity and how to actually look at your own uh, financial liquidity in your business. So I mentioned before, good financial management means that you have in place forecasts, profit and loss statements, balance sheets, cash flow forecasts and that you're using those on a regular basis to monitor and control your business performance. So that helps you, one, identify any strategies that might need to be implemented or adjusted to achieve your profitability and growth goals, but it also enables you to be financially viable for yourselves, for your employees, for your customers, for your suppliers, and for those people that you're looking at to access funding through. So let's talk break even. So does everybody know their break even point? <laughs> well, um, uh, with the charity, obviously, we're uh, at the point of sending a lot of mm -hmm. funds in there, but we haven't got any uh, real expenses going out except for when we purchase we've got a clothing label to generate funds. Yes. So besides that, um, yeah, we're sort of Fortunately, you haven't got the expense. We're not worried about paying ourselves or anything for, you know, for a long, long time. The first party is, is invested into, uh, into the kids. So, do so they have any fixed expenses or no, anything like that at this no, stage? No, yes, yay. No, we, I know, <laughs> yay, that's exactly right. It's coming. It's coming. But, yeah. yeah. And Meryl, you're in a little bit of a flux at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's only me. Yeah. And I, yeah, I service business so I don't yeah. really have any expenses either although I are I am investing in new website and yeah. new business card you know because they're I've never had to six years I've had this consultancy and I've never had to advertise I've never it's all yeah. come to me only because I've been so well known in the industry in the corporate level but not in the independent level so now I've got to put myself out there in the independent yeah. space and yeah so that's why I'm, I've that's my expenses at the moment is getting yeah. all of that sort of 
very, very lucky. I've got a very good friend who's doing all my graphics and everything for me. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, tap into the networks at the moment. Yeah. Crucial, remember, anything <laughs> free right. or low cost is great. That's right. Okay, so what is a break even? It's the volume of the sales that you need to cover your fixed costs and your overheads before you make any profit or loss. So until you calculate and work, hit that break even sales point, there is no profit coming to you from your business. So it's a really important management tool that we use to determine your profitability of various product lines, your profitability of different business units, how far your sales can actually drop before you start incurring losses, how many units of particular items you need to sell before the business starts to become profitable, what happens to your profitability if your overheads increase, your overhead is increased, you need to sell more to break even again, and how many sales you need to be made whenever any of your variable costs increase. So the break even is a really important basic tool that we like to teach business owners as a starting point in any financial analysis. And in true accounting fashion, there's a formula. So I'll put the formula up there. This is to calculate it on a unit basis. So it's your fixed cost divided by your selling price minus your variable costs. And the bottom half we call your contribution margin. So that contribution margin is effectively your gross profit. And we'll talk through a couple of examples on how we go about calculating that. So I want to start with some really simple examples. Um, I was going to do a bit of more of a complicated one for those of you who might be online, online who have multiple business units and different uh, types of products. However, given we've only got an hour and a half, I didn't want to... Um, that would probably take me an hour and a half to go through that detailed one. So I'm just going to give you two really simple examples so that you can understand the basics of how to do it and go away and have a little bit of a play yourself. So let's look at a doctor. I chose a doctor, she's a service industry because everybody knows who a doctor is and everybody has a doctor. So let's assume Mrs. Smith is our local GP and she knows that to meet her minimum monthly or minimum family outgoing, she needs to earn at least $130,000 a year. She also knows that the overhead, she's a single practitioner practice, so there's only her and a, um, uh, a office junior that answers the phone and processes payments and things. So her overheads, which includes the office junior wages, the rent admin, her insurance, which we all know is massive for doctors, um, total $200,000. So that means for her to hit her income target, she's got to earn at least $330,000 a year. So what does that mean on a weekly or a daily basis? And this is how far I like clients to drill down to. So you need to know what is your sales target on a weekly basis and a daily basis, and you need to be tracking those sales targets and how you're actually performing against those targets on a regular basis. So for the doctor here, we need to recognise the fact that, yes, she's got 330000 she needs to earn, but she's actually only working 44 weeks of the year because she might have some time off sick because of all the germs she's exposed to. There's public holidays. There's annual leave that she's going to take. So she's only actually got 44 weeks. So this is a very basic break-even calculation for Mrs Smith. So if we have a look at the line, I can't point up there because the won't record it. If we have a look at the line that talks about how many weeks she works, so we know she needs to earn 330,000. We know she's only got 44 weeks a year that she's available to work. So that means she's got to hit 7,500 in gross fees a week. So on a day, that's $1,500 a day. We also know that her average consultation fee is $70 a patient. So that means for her to hit that $1,500 a day target, she has to see 22 patients a day, which is ridiculous when you think about it. But that's equivalent to the 20-minute Medicare. <laughs> well, Medicare is actually 15, I think. It's some, mm -hmm. Is it 15 or 20 I minutes? I can't so. remember. So that's how we come to the figure for Mrs. Smith, that she has to see 22 patients a day, which means if she spends more time with one patient, she has to charge more than her average consultant fee. So that's a very break, basic break-even analysis. In your um, financial management workbook, so everybody has a copy of their financial management workbook, which has some additional examples. 
I've given you an example on page six that contains Cabello's Coffee Shop. And what we did here, now this is a coffee shop, it's one of the little hole in the world coffee shops, so all they do is actually sell coffee. However, the principles in this can apply if they sell muffins or, or other um, types of food and beverage as well. So this one is fixed costs. So fixed costs in this case, they've got some rent, they've got a phone, they've got insurance, they've got electricity. So your fixed costs do not change. So your fixed costs are costs that are incurred regardless of whether you sell anything or not. Your variable costs are what change. So your variable cost is the direct cost of producing or purchasing the good that you actually are selling. So in this case, it might be milk, um, it might be the coffee itself, it might be some direct labour. So the cost of actually um, how much time it takes and how much wage you want to allocate to the, to the actual making of the coffee. And then we've got our sales price in our fixed example. So if we flip over, we've told that Cabello's fixed cost total 99 odd thousand. We told that they sell their coffee for $3.80. So first thing I would do is they put the prices up. They're way too cheap. We can buy coffee for $3.80. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> we know that their variable costs for the coffee is $1.35. So it costs them about $1.35 just to make the coffee itself before they've covered any fixed costs. So if we put this into our formula, which is fixed costs divided by your selling price minus your variable cost per unit, we know they have to set, make 40,495 cups a year to be able to break even. We also know at $3.80, that means their sales figure for the year has to be about 154,000. So what does that mean in terms of how many they need to sell each day? So let's break that down. They're open five days a week. They're only open 50 weeks a year. They do shut for a couple of weeks. So they're 250 days of trading. So that means they have to sell 162 cups of coffee a day. So every business on a business unit basis needs to know what their break even point is. Now I know these are quite simple examples that I'm showing you, but the method methodology that you apply is exactly the same. So if you've got multiple business units, as the majority of my clients do, it's really important that your financial reporting system is established so you can track the business unit performance at, at each level. So that means setting up your divisional reporting. So divisional reporting can be done in your zero and your myob and allocating your job costings correctly and allocating the overhead contributions where possible. Now, somebody might say to me, oh, look, I've got four units, um, four business units, um, I've got one rent expense, how do I allocate that? And it's just, um, in that situation, I would look at the size of each business unit and try and work out a percentage and maybe allocate that in terms of the factory layout, or I might look at a percentage of sales. So it's really just coming up to some sort of basis for allocating so that you can get a really good understanding of how each unit is, is performing. So that's the first thing I'd like you all to go away and prepare. Calculate your break-even unit. The second thing, I want us to create our financial roadmap. So I want us to try and create a forecast profit and loss, a balance sheet and a cash flow. And these are the tools that you're going to use to demonstrate the financial viability of your business and allow you to monitor and control your business performance. And finally, benchmark your performance. Because it's all well and good to think you're traveling okay in isolation, but how's everybody else in your industry going? If your net profit sitting at 2% and your industry average is 10%, you need to have a little bit of a look about what's going on in your business and benchmarking will help you do that. So when I talk about cash flow management, I'm talking about three key elements. First one, have one. The amount of most, the amount of businesses that I come across that don't have cash flows or forecast budgets is astounding to me. Every business should have those three key reports. They should be updated and monitored regularly so that step item two, you can head off any problems before they occur. And then the third reason 
that you want to have this is so that you can use those to develop and monitor strategies to ensure that your cash flow maintenance is correct and adequate for your business. So that means looking at your credit management, your inventory management, your inventory controls, your billing processes, your debtors, creditors, controls, etc. Because as anybody who's run a business for a little while will know, making a profit does not equal money in the bank. They are two completely different things. And over the course of the last 25 years as an accountant, I can tell you that I have unfortunately seen profitable businesses on paper who closed down because they couldn't manage their cash flow correctly. Particularly if you're going through a growth phase or with, if you're in really uncharted territory like we are now. Okay, so developing your cash flow forecast. So there's a template which I have given you. Um, I'm just going to swap screens here for a second. And in this template, I've just done a very, very simple cash flow. So you've each got this in soft copy so that you can go away and work on it throughout the year. Now remember, this is very different to a profit and loss. So this is the cash inflows and cash outflows on a monthly basis when they actually occur. So if we have a look, I've filled in some figures for the first three months. So if we have a look, we start at the top. Oh no, I stopped sharing. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, hello, Emily. Yeah. I can see you there. Let me try this. I'm hoping you can see that. Emily, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the cash flow forecast on the screen? Yeah, I can see it. Oh, we can hear you. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks, I'm a little bit late. That's okay. Where are you from, Emily? Um, I'm from an event management company called Beyond Experiences. Okay, great. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your business quickly. Um, so we're in about our fifth year, so I guess that growth stage, uh, which isn't growing this year, um, <laughs> unfortunately, we're pretty dormant. Um, so we create um, bespoke uh, experiences, events um, and escapes for predominantly um, business events. So we do big corporate events, everything from gala events through to sort of day experiences um, and incentive programs. Um, yeah, and a lot of celebration events and so forth uh, all over the Sunshine Coast. So you have been really hit hard in the last yeah. few months. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so come even uh, January, I already felt it because we have uh, interstate clients who had had overseas um, events planned but pulled the overseas to come yeah. to Noosa, well, a couple of them had, so I was already planning them in January and then they got pulled come February, um, so I've had absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. So I'm refining my business and making it better for when we relaunch. Well, that's a great use of your time and, you know, look, it, sometimes these things um, I'm, it's awful, and um, but it is, you know, you're doing the right thing at the moment in terms of refocusing and trying to pivot and trying to get some new skills up so that you're ready to go as soon as things start kicking off again. Yeah. Have you found that there's been any bookings maybe starting to happen for either the end of the year or early next year? Um, not for myself personally. Um, I also had a little bit of a gap year last year. I ended up travelling for most of last year. <laughs> but, uh, so, Lucky I, you I, last year. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, was quite just, I didn't do any marketing last year. So I was coming back this year to, to um, I guess, hit the ground running, which didn't eventuate. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a bit of a, I'm in a little bit of a different situation, but I know a lot of people in my industry had put a, 
uh, events, say weddings especially, off till say September because I thought that was going to be the safe zone. But um, everyone's still quite unknown. Um, I've had a few briefs through, but they're very uncertain. So people just don't want to plan because things can change so quickly. Um, oh, so no, I don't. I don't have really anything um, happening. Okay, well, fingers crossed. Yeah, thank Queensland you. stays okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We and I'm just yeah. seeing some things roll out here. It was interesting because we did this one as a little bit of a test because this is the first like in house workshop that we've actually offered for a while through the Calandra Chamber. Um, and people, I think, are still very weary at this stage. And I think the Melbourne, recent Melbourne outbreak mm. didn't help as well. No, definitely yeah. not. And now Sydney's on edge. I know. As yeah. well, to, you know, mm. scary. Well, thank you for coming, Emily. So um, we'll, we'll move on. So in, did you get the soft copies of everything sent through to you this morning? Yep, yep, I've got everything. Right. So we're just going to have a look at the cash flow. So really simple, basic cash flow. So normally when we accountants do these, we do what we call a three-way forecast. So we'll forecast your P&L and your balance sheet and that'll flow through your cash flow so that we've got everything actually coming in there at the same time. If you're not an accountant, that can be quite a difficult job to do. So what I've tried to do is keep this as simple as possible so at least everyone can track their cash flow. So it simply sales in, any other income that you're getting in, any other GST refunds. So GST is a little bit tricky at the moment with the cash flow boost because depending on what your situation is in terms of your pay as you go withholding and any GST that you may have to pay, your cash flow boost could actually be reduced off your potential GST refund. However, it's really important that you consider your BAS payment terms. So what is your BAS actually going to look like in advance so that if you are in a payable situation you can start making sure that you're planning for that. If not, are you planning for any cash flow boost that might come through to actually support that? So you need to be bearing in mind that when you're calculating your GST payments or refunds that you need to be thinking about any cash flow boost if you've registered for those. The other thing that you need to think about is any job keeper payments that we're bringing in. Um, because it's really important that we bring this income in um, so that we can see what's going to happen when we take away that false income streams from those two programs at the end of September. So your expenses, I've just listed some really uh, standard examples that are straight off, you know, a typical chart of accounts from any sort of accounting program here. So when you see the gap, we're moving on to some of the balance sheet items here. So we're starting with our cash in that was at the top of the spreadsheet. We've added in all of the incomings that we've got. We're taking out all of the outgoings. Now it's really important when you're looking at cash flow that you're also factoring in GST payments, your quarterly pay as you go withholding payments. So that means if you're putting wages in, you're not doubling up on your pay as you go withholding. Because if you think about it, you don't remit your pay as you go withholding. It depends on with what type of withholder you are. You only remit that monthly or quarterly or sometimes even weekly if you're really large. But for most of it, it's monthly or quarterly. So you need to be showing your salary and wages net of your pay as you go withholding in your cash flow statement. And then work out when the actual payments of your pay as you go withholding is to bring those in. So in the example that I've given you, the wages are shown net and they're on quarterly pay as you go withholding for this particular client. The other thing that you need to factor in is your pay as you go installments. So if you are a company, um, sorry, not a company, but a business, so depending on what type of business you are, you might be set up on a pay as you go installment basis. So it's important that you're factoring any of, of those pay as you go installment amounts that you might have to pay on your buzzers as well. The other thing that you need to think about is loan payments and drawings. So obviously your loan payments will come out in a lump sum if you're on principal and interest. So we need to be putting the lump sum amount in here um, in terms of the physical cash outgoing that we're paying. You also need to be factoring in any asset purchases. So in this situation, this client, as you can see, has a decent cash balance at the end of the month. Um, at the end of August. So they have decided that rather than borrow 
they're, they've done their forecast for the full financial year, but rather than borrow, they're actually going to pay to purchase a new asset in cash and access the instant asset write-off that's extended to 31st of December. So one of the reasons cash flow is really useful is it can tell you when you might need to look at other funding opportunities. So in this situation, this client we had forecast out for the full 12 months, they had decided, well, we know that our cash flow is going to look good. We haven't been hit by COVID. Um, we're one of the rare. Actually, there are some really yeah. good really businesses well. <laughs> that are, I've got quite a few manufacturers that have pivoted and adapted into hand sanitizer and cleaning. Yeah. We've got online businesses that are killing it mm. at the moment in both retail and also um, training. So there are some businesses that are doing really well during COVID. Um, so for those businesses, they're actually going to use that cash that they're, that they're accruing to make some asset purchases. So they recognise by doing their cash flow that they don't actually they need borrow. to borrow to do that because they're going to have sufficient cash flow to actually achieve it. Other businesses with less cash flow use the cash flow to decide, well, actually, we've got gaps here. How can we address these shortfalls? Do we need to get an overdraft facility? Is that the best way to go? Do we need to get a you know, um, some sort of loan. Is there any sale and leaseback options we should be considering to bring more cash into the business? So unless you've got your cash flow forecasts done, you are unable to make any of those decisions. So the first step, have a go at actually completing one yourself. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So now let's talk cash flow tips. So what can we do to accelerate our cash flow? So we need to think about what's going to bring cash in faster. So we need to accelerate those. We need to think about what we can do to delay our cash outflows. And is there any other actions and strategies that we can actually put in place to help us manage that cash flow? So strategies to accelerate. Invoicing, really important. The amount of clients I see, particularly in the manufacturing and construction industry, who don't, oh, construction industry is a bit different now with QBCC and retention payments, but, um, and uh, sorry, um, invoicing, but um, it, it's really important that you're invoicing promptly. So don't wait until the job's finished and out the door before you invoice. You need to be issuing progress fees or progress invoices throughout the job. Get upfront deposits in. So if anybody signs up or commits to a job, particularly at the moment, you want to be locking them into an upfront deposit. Upfront deposit, progress bill, and then final bill at the end is really critical. Don't just wait until you finish your job before you actually issue that invoice. So prompt invoicing is critical. The other thing that I see a lot of is clients missing stuff on invoices because you're not tracking, you haven't got your job costing set up properly, or you're not tracking all the expenses associated with the job. So your invoicing needs to be accurate and right the first time, because there's nothing worse from a client's perspective mm. if you send a second invoice for, for a higher amount because you stuffed it up. So basically, your invoice needs to be prompt, it needs to be accurate, and it needs to be progress built throughout the job. So that's the first thing, review your invoicing. Second thing, have a look at your accounts receivable policy. So have a look at your terms. We're in a really risky situation at the moment. So the first thing you need to be thinking, if you're at, um, giving people credit or giving them goods or services on account, who are you giving them to? Is it your premium customers? Are there people that you have dealt with and you know are reasonably safe to get that money back? from. Um, so you need to be really thinking about who you're giving your credit card, credit terms to. You need to think about whether it's worth to accelerate your own cash inflow flows, thinking about discounts for upfront payments. Now, you've got to be really careful here and you've got to know your gross profit margins to make sure that you've got enough in there to be able to do this. But you need to think about, am I better off getting this cash in faster? and taking slightly less money for it, or am I better off waiting? Um, and you might find that, you know, some people will wait until they pay the bill. Other people want to take advantage of the discount, but it's something that you need to be considering. The other thing is make sure it's easy for your clients to pay you. 
So if you're doing BPAY or FPOS transactions, you know, if you're doing BPAY and that sort of thing, you need to have your bank and your BPAY details really clearly identified on your invoices. Um, what we're seeing a lot more of now is clients requesting direct debits or um, there's a lot of systems and software out there that will actually generate or, or, or automate this for you. So that, you know, if you're doing a pit process or a, a lump sum of work for a client that might go over three months or six months, it will automatically direct debit their account over that period on a monthly basis. So give people that option. Think about Afterpay. Um, has pros and cons associated with it, but you need to be thinking about how am I going to make my customer as easy as possible to make the sale and get the cash in. And regular client communication is essential. So you need to be on top of this. Again, it amazes me how many clients I come across who might have trade terms of seven or 14 days and their debtors days are sitting at 45 and they don't even know it. And they're saying to me, oh, but I get my trade terms are seven days. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're not. They're 45. Because let's have a look at your day's debt and debtors. You know, oh, are they? Yes, mm -hmm. they are. You need to be on top of that. So you need to have processes and procedures in place to monitor these. You need to be negotiating payment plans with your clients and your customers as soon as you think there is a potential issue. So any bad debt risk, particularly in the current environment, needs to be identified and managed as early as possible. So you need to be developing your internal systems. You need to think about who you're selling to, what trade terms you're giving to them, who's monitoring this internally, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but how often they're communicating with them, how they're recording that communication. You need to have your systems critically in place to survive the next six months if you're going to offer sales on credit. So you also want to do the other side of things when you're looking at your creditors. So utilize your own terms of trade. So if you're dealing with suppliers who offer silly, who, who are generously enough still offering 30 day payment terms in this current environment, max it out. Use the 30-day payment terms so that you can keep your cash for as long as possible. However, having said that, consider the benefit of early payment discounts if you're in a strong cash flow position for that particular month. The other thing, so you want to do exactly what you want your clients to do with you. So negotiate any contract terms or payment extensions if you're struggling. Okay, so remember we're all in this to support each other. So if you want to be treated well by your clients, please have the, the, the responsibility to do the same thing for the people that you owe money to, not just for them, but also for you so that you can negotiate some payment terms, lock them in, and you're not worried about answering the phone that week. Okay, some other cash flow strategies. Inventory management is a critical one and I've got one of the experts in the room here, so I'm just gonna to touch on this bit briefly. So the more inventory you have and the less stock turnover you have, the more cash you've got tied up that's sitting there not being actively utilized in your business. So you need to be making sure that your inventory levels aren't too high, that you're reviewing your product mix or your service mix and you want to be maximizing your high volume and high margin product lines. So if you've got obsolete stock or really slow moving stock, you need to be identifying those and working out, you know, is it worthwhile to actually keep selling those particular product lines if it's tying up cash for you? So you need to be thinking about that. You need to be thinking about securing your supply chain. So I've had a lot of manufacturers in the last three months that supply chain comes from overseas, particularly China um, and other Southeast Asian countries. And they've been significantly affected. So we've had to look at well, what else can we do here? How can we actually um, get our supply chain secured to make sure that we can continue to be able to make our product to sell it? Because it's, it's all well and good if you, there's a demand for hand sanitizer but if you can't get the bottles to put it in, it doesn't do anyone any favours. So one of the things that everybody needs to do right now 
is review your supply chain. I think most people in the manufacturing, retail, wholesale space have re registered the fact that if you're heavily dependent on one or two particular suppliers, particularly if they're overseas, maybe you need to mix up where your supply chain is actually coming from. Consider alternate funding mechanisms. So obviously we've all made the most of the government stimulus support packages out there, or I hope you have. If you haven't, you need to talk to your accountant ASAP to make sure you're accessing cash flow support, JobKeeper support, any Q rider or federal government loans you can access. If you're taking advantage of any lease deferrals or rent deferrals, make sure that you're accessing what you can. There's some fantastic grant funding programs that have been out recently. And if you are in regional Queensland, and unfortunately regional Queensland excludes Sunshine Coast. However, if you're in regional Queensland, there is still opportunity available for you to apply for the $10,000 small business adaption so grant. Yeah. yeah, so there's still eligibility and opportunity there if you're based in regional Queensland. Southeast Queensland is tapped out. However, have a think about whether you can get something in in the next couple of days to access that 10,000 in grant funding. It's a great opportunity for small businesses affected by COVID. Think about debtors funding, any other sale and leaseback arrangements as well. I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today going through different funding strategies. However, just be mindful that you're having those conversations after you've done your cash flow where you've got potential cash flow gaps or cash flow issues that may be occurring. You should be having those conversations with your accountant um, as soon as you've identified that there's a potential issue. Okay, so that's some tips to minimise your cash in and your cash out. The other thing that you need to be thinking about is the controls that you have in place around your cash flow management and how you can actually use your financial systems to identify any issues before they occur. So that means, excuse me, I'm just going to check if I could get the dry throat. <laughs> so that means document your policy and procedures so that everybody knows what your terms of credit are and you've not got salespeople going and authorizing, um, you know, uh, delayed payments for some of their clients because they want to make the sale when it's outside of your trade terms. So make sure that everybody is on the same page with your terms. Your authorization and collection of um, accounts receivable is going to be critical. The other thing that's really important is that you're looking at your expenditure and the separation of duties around that. Unfortunately, we've had a lot in the press this year about in-house accountants and um, in staff embezzlement. Um, and there are ways if you're working with your accountant that we can actually detect if there's issues going on. But if you don't have that financial system in place to be able to pick that up and stop it before it actually happens, you're exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. So it's really important that you've got separation of duties around any of the cash Handling, and by cash, I mean FPOS and other non-cash transactions. So authorization, um, receipt of income, and payment of income is really, really important. So you need to have policies around your access to your bank accounts. Who has access to actually pay expenses, to record invoices, and allocate them to correct accounts? You need password protection and two-factor authorization controls. It's really important. Don't leave opportunity hanging around for people to do the wrong thing. Okay, the other thing that you need to be thinking about is how to make your three key profit drivers work for you. So in any given business, there's three ways you can make more money. Increase your sales, reduce your cost of goods sold, which is your variable costs, and reduce your overhead expenses, which are your fixed costs. So what can we do to do those things? So if you're looking at increasing your sales, review your pricing policies. Um, it's amazing to me how many people don't do this on a regular basis or don't do any competitor analysis to coffee see. Shop. Yeah, yeah, the coffee, Cabello's <laughs> coffee shop, put your prices up. Um, or don't do any competitor analysis to see what other people in their industry are charging. 
um, know what your margins are, know what your break even again is. Um, look at your product mix. So what are you selling? Um, what is your high margin product? The easiest way to make money is sell more of what you've got at a higher margin. That's the way you're going to make money. Review your variable costs. So have a look at the supplier mix. Have a, you know, maintain your, your supply chain. Is there anything you can do to generate economies of scale in some way, shape or form? Reduce your fixed costs. So educate yourself. What are your fixed costs? What can you do to reduce those? And negotiate. Um, again, a lot of businesses, they stick on it. They set a payment plan up for you know, their funds. If you're a big business, th those phone costs can be a considerable percentage of your sales. Review them yearly. Insurance, absolutely review yearly. So educate yourself on what your fixed cuts are and negotiate with suppliers to get better rates. And another really important thing that I can't stress enough of how important it actually is, as um, business owners, we like to focus on increasing turnover and reducing costs. And that's great in terms of one strategy for profit improvement. But what that focus does is it doesn't eliminate inefficiency that exists within that business. So you need to consider a waste audit. So we've got seven key waste areas that exist within any business. How can you reduce potential waste in your business to increase efficiency? You increase efficiency, you increase profitability. So think about talking to your accountant or your advisor about how you go about doing a waste audit. I've already done a um, webinar on this previously. However, it might be a good time to roll out a second webinar around what a waste audit is and how you can do one for your business. So once you've done all that and you've got your financials done, your forecast, profit and loss, your balance sheet and your cash flow statements, then what can you do with them? Every business should have financial and operational key performance indicators that they are measuring on a regular basis. So I'm going to teach you some really basic but very key KPIs from a financial perspective today. I'll also take you through the basics of variance analysis and how it's a really good way for you to look at what's happening when you're not achieving your budgets. I'll give you some quick tips on financial benchmarking and ratio analysis and then we'll do a little bit of action planning to wrap up today's session. So normally I would have a bit of a break, but we'll just keep going at this point, given there's only a few of us here. Um, so as I said before, there's three key factors to, about profitability and cash flow. So increasing sales, reducing costs and calculating your working capital. So we quite often hear this term working capital, but a lot of us don't really understand what that actually means. Working capital is sufficient, is simply having sufficient liquid assets to meet all of your business commitments as they fall due. So liquid assets are things that are easily converted into cash. So working capital looks at things like your cash balances, your debtors, your creditors, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. And it's a really good indicator as the overall financial health of your business. So every business should have a working capital or current ratio or a liquidity ratio, whatever you want to call them. They, in true accounting speak, we make it as confusing as possible for business owners and have multiple terms for the same thing. But it should always be greater than one when you're calculating it. And I'll take you through some of those calculations in a minute. Variance analysis. So we've got our forecast profit and loss and balance sheet. We've got our cash flow. Are we finished then? Is that it? We're done? We've got good financial management practices in place? No. Step one. Step two is review them. In, and review them on a timely basis to your actual results. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a real client example of mine. It's different numbers, obviously. But this is a manufacturing client. So when I started working with these guys, they're quite a large manufacturer down in Brisbane. Um, they had never done a proper forecast three-way P&L balance sheet and cash flow. They had some basic templates that they created, but not a really proper one. And when they did, 
They only looked at the top line figure, which was sales. Are we hitting our sales target? And that's all they really cared about. So what we started to do is we said, well, let's actually look how the business is performing on a monthly basis. Let's go through your forecast budget and your actual. And we said that, okay, well, straight away your sales dropped by 50 grand this month. What happened? And the production equipment broke down. And we started talking a little bit more about what was going on. The production equipment was old. It needed to be upgraded. So we did, this all came out through a part of a strategic planning process. It was a, it was a long process, but to cut a long story short, Variance analysis helps you work out where you've got problems. So you look at what your budget is, what your actual is, what's the variance, why it was caused, and what you're going to do to actually address it. So in this particular example, we also saw that their energy costs had started to go through the roof. So they used gas. Gas prices and energy costs have gotten really expensive. Um, so we looked at that was affecting their margins, which was affecting their profitability. So we said, okay. What can we do here? We need to upgrade our production equipment. What type of production equipment? What's the use of the biggest energy? And what's the equipment, if we had a magic wand, that we would actually replace that would allow us to either manufacture what we're currently manufacturing at a much lower cost and in a more efficient way, and or expand our product mix. And we came up with this U-Butte fiber laser cutter. So we moved away from gas, reduced our energy costs, only problem was it was in Germany and it was $1.8 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, we then accessed the Made in Queensland grant funding program through a long process and they got 950000 towards purchasing that. Mm -hmm. So that all came about planning, developing budgets mm -hmm. and completing variance analysis. It is a great example of why you need to be on top of your numbers to stop problems before they occur and look at alternative solutions. So when we're talking profitability, these are the key ratios that us accountants look at. For the purposes of today, we've spoken about your break-even point, and I'm going to take you through the really simple counts of gross profit margin and net profit margin. So when we're talking about margins, you understand what's what. Okay, so gross profit margin. What is it? What does it mean? How do you calculate it? Again, formula. So your gross profit margin, you need to know what your variable costs are, and I'm calling that your cost of goods sold. So you need to have your systems in place to be able to identify those. And the formula is simply your total sales minus your variable costs, which gives you your gross profit over your total sales times 100, and that'll give you a percentage. And what does that percentage mean? That tells us how much profit is generated for every dollar of sales that covers your fixed overheads. So for example, if you have a 30% gross profit, that means for every dollar of sales, you generate 30 cents of that sale goes towards covering your overheads. So that's one thing. You need to know what it is. You need to track it. You need to maximize it. So clients often say to me, well, what should it be? It depends. <laughs> what your guys think is that. Yeah, it depends on what you are producing. It mm. depends on what industry you're in. It depends on where you are located. It depends on the size of your turnover. It is very heavily in industry dependent. On average, it's between 30 and 50%, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. However, you need to know what it is. You need to know what your industry is um, as a whole. What's your industry average? And you need to be benchmarking yourself against relatively similar sized businesses in your industry. And um, we do this a lot with our clients and it is a fantastic mm -hmm. exercise because we have access to a lot of different databases that you know, we pay for. So normal people don't have access to those. But there are some published benchmarks, particularly the ATO supposedly publishes small business benchmarks. I find they're two years old, they're very specific, and they're not very broad. Um, so talk to your accountant to find out and talk to your industry groups. You know, they will be able to give you this information for free. Um, so you should be benchmarking. You should know what it is and you should be benchmarking your business against the industry average and tracking how you're going. You want your gross profit to be trending upwards. 
So you want to, if you're starting at 28%, set a target. So if you're getting 28 to 40% by the end of the year, that means you're getting an extra 12 cents in your pocket for every <coughs> dollar of sales. So you need to be monitoring it. Net profit. So your net profit is the percentage that you're, you've got that your business has actually generated for you after you've taken out every single expense that you've got. So it's simply your total sales minus all of your expenses over your sales times 100. And again, most clients say to me, well, what should it be? Well, at the very least, it needs to be positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a negative net profit, you're making losses and, and you're in trouble. Also okay. depends if they take their wages out of it as well, which... I, I we find. do we do an um, analysis when mm. we benchmark. We will look at because um, if you think about it, a lot of clients want to sell a business at some point. Mm. So you've got to actually make it a realistic wage. So if they're working in the business and the industry average to manage that business like they're doing is one hundred and twenty thousand, that wage, whether you take it out as drawings or whatever, that should actually be factored in to your calculation. They should be. Take what's left. There's yeah. nothing left. But no, <laughs> you need to factor in your own wage. Pay yeah. yourself when Absolutely. you're calculating your net profit. If you're not mm -hmm. taking drawings or salary and wages, you need to be factoring them into your calculations so that you're comparing like for like. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum, your net profit should be, again, industry dependent, but you want to be looking at at least 5 to 10%, sometimes higher depending on what your investment is. So again, it's industry, location, size dependent, but you need to know it. You need to track it, you need it to be going up, and you need to be making sure that you're accounting for yourself and your own money to come out of that to pay yourself in these calculations. Okay, we've talked a lot about cash flow. Cash flow is all about liquidity. How quickly can you generate cash through your business? How much cash do you have access to? to be able to pay your bills? Have you got any cash shortfalls? And there's a number of different um, calculations that we look at. So you need to know what your credit a days is. So that's how long you're taking to pay people. You need to know what your debt a day is, like, days are. So as in the example I gave earlier, if your trade terms are seven days and your debt a days are sitting in 45, people aren't paying you in accordance with those trade terms. Why not? You're not, you're not sticking to your guns. So you need to know what these figures are. You need to know how many times your stock turns over a year. Okay, it needs to at least be more than one. Um, and uh, ideally, what were you saying earlier? Well, it's really a small operation, one store or even two stores, should be easily doing five stock turns. So five. I mean, we, have, we have big businesses. We had 300 stores and they were still doing two and a half to three stock turns. Mm. So, you know, a one store operation should be able to do, do it more than that. Yeah. 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 Okay, but you need to know what they are. Mm. You need to be calculating mm. them at the very first mm. part. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to take you through the working capital ratio. So, this is a really simple liquidity ratio that gives you an indication of how well you're managing your liquid assets. So, liquid assets are things like inventory accounts receivable, um, you know, your revenue collections, which I call debtors, again, accounting speak, sometimes we call them accounts receivable, sometimes we call them debtors, they're the same thing. Same with creditors, sometimes we call them creditors, sometimes we call them accounts payable, mm -hmm. they're the same thing. So it's how well your business deals with your inventory management, your debt management, your revenue collection, your payments to suppliers, and also your inventory. So at a minimum, when you calculate this ratio, it needs to be greater than one. That simply says you can pay, if it's over one, you can pay your bills as and when they're falling due. If it's less than one, you've got some liquidity issues. Now, if you're a retail or a manufacturing firm, um, that needs to be closer to two or, or possibly even higher. But at a minimum, everybody's needs to be greater than one and you need to be calculating it regularly and knowing where you're at. Um, once you've got those, benchmark. So find out what your industry averages are for those three key ratios. You know, your gross profit, your net profit, your, your liquidity ratio, 
and look at what you can do when you benchmark yourself against other people in your industry. So benchmarking helps you identify where cost savings and efficiency gains can be made. So if you're accessing the right data and you're doing it properly in conjunction with the accountant, it'll tell you things like, is your rent expense higher than industry standard? If so, what can you do about it? Is your wages expense and your sales per, is your wages expense higher than the industry average? Or is your sales per employee lower than industry average? Again, what can you do about it? Mm -hmm. um, it'll tell you whether your inventory costs are higher um, than competitors. So if your margins are lower, why? Why are they lower than industry average? What can you do to improve it? Can you negotiate better rates? Have you got too many staff? Are you, doing, are you paying too much overtime for your direct labour? So it'll help you identify where you've got those potential issues. <coughs> it'll help you identify how the profit level of your business compares with other businesses in the same industry. So it's a great way to monitor your employee productivity levels. It also tells you how your business is performing overall. So is your liquidity ratio lower? Do you have higher stock levels? Have you got slow turnover stock? How are you carrying absolute stock? So it'll help you identify these potential problems. Okay, that's kind of the content of what I wanted to cover today. I do have some individual reflection activities, but for those of you who are here and Emily, do you have any questions that you want to ask about cash flow or anything that we've talked about today? Not at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, no, good, thank you. Okay. What you've got in your workbook is you've just got, so on page 12 and 13, there's a little bit of um, individual at reflection activity. So from the information that you've heard today and from the templates and that you've been given, I want you to think about what are you going to do differently? when you get back to the office around how you're going to manage your financial arrangements within your business. How are you going to use your financial statements to improve your business performance? What are your key financial performance indicators? Do you know what your gross profit margin is? If not, calculate it. Calculate your net profit. Calculate your liquidity ratios. And then put in place some performance measurement techniques to actually make sure that you're monitoring how they're going on a monthly basis. So I've given you some individual reflection there to work through. I've also given you a post-completion checklist, just some things to think about when, you, when you're reviewing what we talked about. There's quite a bit of other information contained in this financial management booklet that you've got. There's a really good example of a case study in there on page eight for Krusty's Bakery. And what that does is it just gives you an example of what happens when you go through a really mm. high growth phase and when you're not keeping control of your financial records around that. So have a bit of a read through that. Um, good luck with the next three to six months. As I said at the beginning, we're in, you know, we've all heard the word, we're probably all sick of it, unprecedented, uncharted <laughs> waters. <laughs> But, you know, we actually are. Nobody knows what's going to happen no. with the economy. It's in a really strong state of flux. The only thing you can do is ensure that your business is best placed and best planned to try and find a way to pivot to capitalise on any opportunities that might be available to you. Or at the very least, have your financial systems in place so that you can monitor the impact and heat off any problems before they occur. Well, that's it. From me. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. See you, Emily. Bye. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.